is the photoelectric effect problem. Now remember yesterday we covered the photoelectric effect. Today we're going to do the 2018 paper question. Are you, are you ready for it? So let's see how ready we are. You were born ready, were you, Makai? You're going to need, um, you're going to need a calculator maybe, unless you're really Einsteinian at, at <laughs> mental arithmetic. So let's read. The threshold frequencies of cesium and potassium are given in the table below. Cesium and potassium, they're two metals in group one. Have a look at the threshold frequencies of both. Photoelectric effect, question 11. Okay, so those are the threshold frequencies. So Nelly, what is meant by a threshold frequency? Just, do you remember from yesterday, we said that light needs a certain frequency to make an electron, and make an electron stand up off the atom. Do you remember that? So what do you think the relationship to threshold frequency is? That's the frequency it needs to stand up. So, for the benefit of everybody, let's do it again. Threshold frequency. One, two, and three, and four. Now that is the frequency at which there's just enough to stand up. So let's everybody stand up. And one, and two, and three, and four, and five. So stand up at the back there, thanks. So that is your threshold frequency. Asanda, stand up, thank you. So it's enough to get an atom to just leave, an uh, electron to just leave the atom. Threshold frequency. Okay. Now, Michelle, next question. We've got two threshold frequencies. Cesium and potassium. Which one is higher? Potassium. So this is higher. Because it's a bigger number. Okay, makes sense. Now tell us, without what does it mean to have a higher threshold frequency? Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What does it mean? To have a higher threshold frequency is a good thing. Explain why. Why is it a good thing? If you were making a photovoltaic panel, would you want a low or a high threshold frequency? No. Low, sir, so, because it uses less energy. So, you see, Michelle listens in class. I have to hand it to you. She absorbs 100% of what is said, and this is one of the secrets to doing well. She knows that a low frequency, a low threshold frequency means it takes less energy for the electron to be knocked off, which is a good thing if you're trying to knock off electrons and make electricity. Am, is she right? Makes sense? So which is the better one for losing electrons? Which one's the better one? The first one. Okay, so this is better at losing electrons. So let me make sense? Okay, let's carry on. Define the term work function in words. And then, what is the work function in words? 
weeks. It's your question next. Have a guess. What is the work function? Come on, have a go. What is the work function? I'm asking a name. Just let's see how many people think they've got some idea what the work function is. Just hands up how many think they know what the work function is. It's the minimum amount of energy which comes from the frequency to get the electron to lose, leave the atom. So what is the work function? It's the minimum energy to get an electron to leave an atom. Does that make sense? So when you stood up, that was we were demonstrating you were leaving the atom. That's called W naught. Okay, next question. Which one of the two metals in the table has a higher work function? Cassie? Of the two, which has a higher work function? Exactly. So which one has a higher work function? WO of potassium is greater than W naught cesium. Why? Because this is equal to HF and H the F naught of potassium is greater than F naught of cesium. Now come on, I want you to look at that. Temeletu? Let me say that again and then I want you to repeat it. Okay? You've got to pay attention here. You see those two frequencies? If we multiply them by H, we get the work function. Now H is a constant. So if the F naught is higher, it means the work function is higher. So look which one's higher. That one's higher, the potassium. So therefore the work function of potassium is higher than the work function of cesium. Does that make sense? No. Remember, you've got, to, you've got to be able to repeat it to me, so you mustn't say yes if it doesn't make sense. Okay, let's go it again. What is work function? HF. Does that make sense to everybody? That's on your BFF. So which F is higher? The potassium. Therefore, which one's work function is higher? The potassium. Make sense now? Okay, Timber, let you explain that to the class. <laughs> explain it to the class. What is work function equal to? Read it off. Work function equal? Equal? What is this? This is the letter? And this is the letter F with a naught. So what does H stand for? Anybody? Planck's constant on your BFF. What does F naught stand for? The threshold frequency. So what is the work function? It's equal to Planck's constant times the threshold frequency. Say that. Work function equals Planck's constant times the threshold frequency. Everybody say it. Work function equals Planck's constant times the threshold frequency. Fakile, does that make sense to you? Tendi, does that make sense to you? So now, okay, Tegan, Tegan. Which of these two has the higher work function? Explain why. Because it's got the higher threshold frequency. So when we multiply it by a constant, both of them, 
the one with the higher frequency is going to be the higher work function. Now, Tyreek, which metal is going to require more energy to knock off an electron? Which metal? Cesium or potassium? Exactly. Explain to us why, Tyree. Because it's got the higher threshold frequency, therefore the higher work function. Come on, you guys have got to learn the language of science. There we go, but well done. Okay, let's get on to the next question. So they say give one, um, which one of the two and why we've given the reason here. 11.3, by means of a calculation, determine whether the ammeter in B will, be, will also register a current. Now let's have a look at the little circuit, what they've got. They've got an ammeter, then they've got a vacuum, then they've got a little metal there, which is made out of cesium in this case. Yes, is the symbol. Then they've got a thing here, and then they've got that. Now look, the ammeter reads something here. The little needle moves. What happens is light shines. Let's use a different color. Light shines on the cesium. I can tell they're different. No, oh, that's red. Can't you tell? So light f falls on the cesium. And Anna, does it sunlight or this light that they shine, which is actually ultraviolet light, does it knock off an electron which causes a ammeter to register a reading? Yes. Okay, so here's the question. The ammeter says it's got a reading, but there's a gap here. What is happening is light is knocking off electrons and that's completing this open circuit. So the electrons are flying off the cesium and they're going onto this plate here and so we get an electric current flowing. Happy with that everybody? Happy with that? Okay. So actually, actually the direction it's flowing is this direction if we want to be totally specific. So the electrons are flying off and completing the circuit. Okay, so Jamie. She's a man. Maybe I'll ask you a nice question then. Is, and have I not asked Anna that question? Yet? What was the question I asked you? I was always nervous for the thing. What was the question? Ah, what is it? Let me ask it again, Anna. Which of these two circuits, if I put cesium here, or let's even use a different color, if I put potassium here, so I could put potassium here. So Anna, of the two, which do you think will cause a current to flow better? Cesium or potassium? Which has got the higher work function? Come on, guys, this was five minutes ago. Which has got the higher work function? Potassium. That means it takes more work to get it to move. So, which one's going to produce the current more easily? Cesium. Make sense? Make sense, you guys? You see, the work. Okay, here's the work function. Let's put it, you're a student. It takes a certain amount of work to get you to work, right? I'm the teacher, I've got to get you to work. If you've got a low work function, it means I don't have to do much for you to get you to do your work. Does that make sense, Jamie? Now, cesium is a model student. Cesium doesn't take much on the part of the light to get it to get up and run around. Potassium takes a lot of input before it will do any work. Happy with that? Because the threshold frequency of cesium is lower, therefore less input energy is required. 
Now, let's ask your question, Danny. Thank you. If I have potassium here or cesium here, which one of them is going to produce a bigger current? For the same light? Cesium, because it's easier to get cesium off its ass. Right? Yes, sir. That's correct, sir. Off its atom. Sorry, I got the wrong word. I'm, I'm going to begin with an A. Okay, so if we've got potassium or cesium, the one that's easiest to get it off its atom is the one that's got a lower work function, a lower threshold frequency. It's much easier to make up. So, okay. Now, they say, let's read it. Ultraviolet light with the same intensity and wavelength of 5.5 .5 times 10, 5.5 times 10 to the negative 7. So this is UV light. And what is that? That's the wavelength. Okay. Now, Timberlet, your question now. Timberlet, can you find your BFF? It's right in the front of your booklet. Find me the equation for that involves velocity, wavelength, and frequency. Can you find that for me? Do you remember it from Doppler? Maybe you remember it straight away. What is the formula? Something equals something times something. Lovely. V equals frequency times wavelength. Okay, what have they given us here? Frequency or wavelength? Wavelength. Now, guys, from Doppler, do we ever like wavelength? Do we like, do we work in other formulae yeah. in wavelength or are yeah. they in frequency? Yeah. What do you say, um, Yuka? Yeah. They're always in frequency or wavelength? Look at this formula we're going to use in a moment. We're going to use E equals HF. It's always frequency. Doppler, it's all frequency. They never use wavelength. But, Yuko, can you use a formula to convert from wavelength to frequency? Did we do that with Doppler? Did we do that? Hang on. Did we do that with Doppler? So do you think we can do it with light? Easy peasy. Question the car? They give the frequency of the cesium and the potassium. Now, what we've got to do is find the frequency of the light. You see, there's three things involved. Cesium, potassium, light. Okay. A con. If we know the wavelength, and if we know the velocity, can we work out the, fre the frequency? Okay, so let's do it. What is the speed of sound? Do you remember it vaguely from Doppler? Lovely, 340. Now there's an equivalent speed of light. Just, Akana, go to page 2. And look for something that looks like the speed of light. And just read out the value for me. Light. Speed. Okay, have you found on page two? Just read it. Three comma zero times ten to the power of eight meters per second. So guys. No, 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 ladies. One of you is going to move if we chat. So, do you remember Einstein had a famous equation E equals MC squared? That's the same C. The speed of light. Now, we're going to use it in this formula here. We're going to use C, which is velocity of light equals frequency times wavelength of light. This is V of light, which is a special name of C. Don't forget that. 
So let's. So let's. Show. V is the velocity of the wave. F is the frequency of the wave. Lambda is the wavelength of the wave. They've given us the wavelength. We can, on our BFF, find C. So it's an easy thing for us to convert and find the frequency of this ultraviolet light. Shall we do it? Okay, for Kile, let's take this equation, let's fill in the values, and let's work out what F is. So we're going to have to put what here? 3 times 10 to the 8 equals frequency times 5,5 times 10 to the minus 7. Does that make sense to you? What? How do you mean you can't see? Well, then sit somewhere else. I want you here. I want my student here because he can see. That's important to me. You must <laughs> Okay, work out the maths and tell me what that comes to. So Nelly, could you try on my calculator? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. In a moment, so Nelly's going to tell me what the answer is. Okay, what you, just give me a, your, read out your answer. You're completely right. Just see if you get that to me. So we work out frequency comes to that. So we divide both sides by 5.5, frequency equals 3 comma 10 to the 8 divided by 5, 5 times 10 to the minus 7. Happy with it? Lovely. So now we've got our ultraviolet light frequency. Did you get that answer? Okay. Tembi, the hardest question of the of them all for you because you're up to it now you this is where this is where students have to think now tell me look at this wavelength 5.45 times 10 to the 14 look at it now tell me here's the question compare it to those two which one is it bigger than both which one is it smaller than or both because by comparing that with that, we know the answer to our problem. I want you to look at that number, 5.45. Of, all of them have got times 10 to the 14, so we can actually ignore the 10 to the 14. Look at 5.45 and compare it with 5.07 and 5.55. And you must now make the connection between all three. That's the most difficult thing and the most important thing. Tell me why, what you connect. Okay, the question is which, is, is this bigger than one of them? Which one? Cesium. Is it smaller than one of them? Yes. Potassium. So is this frequency big enough, bigger than the threshold frequency of cesium? Yes. Is it bigger than the threshold frequency of potassium? No. no. This is where you must get it. You see that number is bigger than that, but smaller than that. Okay, so tell me, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with you. If that ultraviolet frequency is higher than the threshold frequency of cesium, will it knock off a cesium atom? Yes. yes. Lovely. How many know how many figure that out? Will it knock off a cesium atom? Why? Because that's higher than the threshold frequency. Now we know the answer to the question. If we put cesium here, a current will flow. Now, mm. next person. 
I forgot your name for a moment. Sure. So I'll just have to say, sorry. Okay, next person. What about potassium? Tatiana, will the threshold frequency of, will this exceed the threshold fre frequency of potassium? So will potassium get electrons knocked off? Will a current flow? No, it can't complete the circuit because there's no electrons to jump the gap. Therefore, a meter stays dead. Where is Marla? Does that make sense to all of you? <laughs> Who doesn't it make sense to? Okay, Jamie. Tatiana, explain to Jamie what you've just told me. Jamie, does that make sense? Let's say it again. This ultraviolet frequency is lower than the threshold frequency of potassium, therefore the ammeter will not grow. Now, Jamie, they want they want a calculation. And what they want, we have to give them. So this is what I think we need to do. We're going to work out the actual work function of B, which is potassium. See, circuit B is with potassium. We're going to then work out the work function of this light. Now, Lilith, uh, Lilith, Lilith, how do we work out the work function of potassium? <laughs> exactly, which they've given. So we take Planck's constant and multiply it by that. And then we take Planck's constant and multiply it by that. So we get E of a photon of U E light is going to be equal to Hf, right? So we've also got work function of potassium equals Hf naught. Now we compare our two. Okay, see, I'm going to move you. If you check, I'm going to move you. If you check. So there we've got two things to compare. Just have a look at that a little bit. We've got E equals Hf of the UV light. <laughs> And we've got work function of potassium. Do you see how I've subscripted it? Work function is the energy of potassium. And so if we do this calculation and that calculation, you find that that is not enough to get that. Then we can say the energy of a photon is not enough to exceed the work function. Does it? Would that be a calculation that should satisfy them? Yes, sir. Okay, so that should satisfy them. And then the last question they ask is calculate the maximum kinetic energy of an electron ejected in circuit A. Okay, Mikhail. Let's go back here. Can we work out the Okay, let, let's do it this way. Do you remember from yesterday, if there's more energy left over, where does it go into? EK. EK. So when we work out for cesium, are we going to be left, Mikhail, with some EK? Remember, cesium did have yes. its electron knock yes, off, and there's going to be some left over because, because why? That number is bigger than that. 
So if we subtract that from that, that's the amount of EK energy. Do you agree with that? Oh, sorry. Sorry, that's, let me say that again. This is in frequencies. If we convert them into HFs, we get energy. Then once we've got the energy, we subtract this one's energy from that one's energy from this one's energy, we're left with EK. That sounds clumsy. Yes, sir. Does that make sense? Okay. Asanda, just repeat what I've said. Asanda, repeat what we've just said. Thank you. <laughs> what, what is it that we are comparing? We're comparing, to say it louder, with the cesium, which is 507. Can we convert those to energy using E equals HF? And then when we convert that to HF, that to HF, the difference in the energy will go into kinetic energy. Make sense, everybody? Now, let me say something. If you had been doing this question, you would have got how much for it? Much or little? Very little, right? Because you're, you're new, right? You're unused to this. If you had to do the similar kind of problem to this, the second time, would you do better? Yeah. You would do better because you've got one lot of experience. Then when you do it another time, which is the second time, the second problem, you're going to be very good at it. When you do it the third time, it's going to be even expert at it. When you do it the fourth time, you become bored with it. <laughs> we want you to do at least in each of these four problems. You understand why? The first one that you do, you're going to do horribly at. The second one, which I'm giving you right now, is right. You're going to do better because it takes experience. I could say sex is just to put it in, wiggle it around, and poof, bang. But it takes experience. There's more to it if you want to do it properly. <laughs> to use an analogy. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you an actual memo. And the next crop. Okay. Now tell me, before we finish with this, are there any questions before I wrap this off the board? Any questions at all? So is this your... there's the memo for this question that I've done. And then there's the next question, which is another electrostatics, uh, photoelectric effect question. Any questions? This is how I would have done it. Now let's have a look at question number two, electrostatics. Um, not electrostatics, but electro or photoelectric effect. Okay, it says here, this is from question 11 and I think it was 2017. In an excited atom, electrons can jump from lower energy levels to higher energy levels. They can also drop from higher energy levels to lower energy levels. The diagram below, not drawn to scale, shows some of the transitions for electrons in an excited atom. Then it shows 2,044 times 10 to the 18 joules, 
1,937 times 10 to the 18, and then it shows 1.635 times 10 to the minus 18 joules. What are they showing here? Well, you may remember you had your nucleus, and around the nucleus you had energy levels. You did this in grade 10. This was called the first, second, third energy levels, etc. Do you remember that from grade 10? So the atom has got electrons in different energy levels. So let's take the hydrogen atom that's got one electron. Now, if we heat hydrogen, we, call, we say we excite it. It will jump to a energy level number two. Why? Because it's got too much energy. It's jumping around. It, it doesn't want to stay so close to the atom anymore. Now, watch what happens. When it falls back, for example, when it cools, but even when it's hot, it will go back. And as it does, the energy has got to go somewhere, hasn't it? Because energy cannot be created or destroyed. So where does the energy go? It goes into light. And so we get a small jump, uh, a certain wavelength. Now, what if it... What if we excite the hydrogen atom from I mean, the electron to the second or third energy level? That means it can fall back even further. Now, what do you think is going to happen to the wavelength? Will it be smaller or bigger wavelength? Think about it. Will there be more energy released or less? More energy is what? Wavelength. Shorter or longer? Shorter. So here, it's going to, let's get our blue, because blue is the shorter wavelength. So this should actually be red. Is that red? Okay. This here, when it jumps, it's going to do this. Blue. Happy with that? Shorter wavelength. Does that make sense? Why? Bigger energy, shorter wavelength. What happens to the frequency? Higher or lower frequency? Higher. Higher frequency. Now, watch what happens. Now, the, the sun is basically hydrogen. Okay, it's a big ball of hydrogen. And it gives off white light. White light is a combination of red and blue. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. Now, here's a little atom in the atmosphere. It's called an air particle, an air molecule, mostly nitrogen. Okay, there's a nitrogen molecule. Which of these do you think is more likely to hit the nitrogen? This wavelength or this wavelength? That's the one on top. The shorter wavelength is more likely to hit something. Does that make sense? And when it hits something, this is in the air, it bounces down and it, your eye sees it. There's your eye. That is why the sky is blue. Because the white light from the sun is emitting blue and red. The blue being violet, indigo, blue, both all being in the blue range, have small wavelengths, hits the air molecules, bounce off into your eye, therefore the sky looks blue. Make sense? Now, what happens if we have this hit a droplet of water? Will both hit the droplet of water? Okay, both will hit the droplet of water because the droplet of water is bigger than molecules. And you know what you'll see? White. The same light as the sun. Clouds are white because they reflect blue and red. Make sense? Okay. So now you can, around the dinner table, explain why the sky is blue and clouds are white. Sorry? Why is the ocean blue? You know, I'm going to have to Google that. I think it could be because the sky is blue and it reflects the blue of the sky. I think that could be a reason, but I'm not sure. I'll have to check. Okay. Just let's quickly have a look at this question because I want to get you to the next question, which you can do. 
Do the transitions indicated in the diagram lead to an absorption or emission? The question is, is this absorbing or emitting light? It's and therefore we call this an emission spectrum. This is an emission spectrum that we're going to see when we heat something. Calculate the frequency of the photon produced when an electron in an excited atom makes the transition from E4 to E2. So what are you going to do? Who knows how you're going to work that out? You're going to end up with... Look, these are measured in energy, right? So can we work out the difference in energy between E4 and E2? By subtracting the one from the other. E4 minus E2, we get an answer. So there's the energy. But how do we turn energy into frequency? Do we know a formula? I think this is how we're going to do it. Do we know a formula E equals HF? Yes. So if we take the energy difference, we can find out the frequency. I presume that's, I haven't actually looked at this, but I presume that's what I do. Why? Because it's in the section with this formula, that's the only formula really in the section. E equals, all answers equal, e equal 8x. I think that's what we do. You said, does it kind of make sense? So if they give us the energy, we subtract 2,044 times 10 to the minus 18 minus 1.63 times 10 to the minus 18. The difference between the two is that we know H, we work out F. I presume. And then it says here that the threshold frequency of a metal is that in Hertz. Calculate the kinetic energy of the most energetic electron elect ejected when the photon produced in question 1122 is incident on the surface of metal Q. Can you do that? How are you going to do that? So let's suppose we work out F. Then we can work out the work function of that metal. And we can work out the, the energy of this uh, particular photon, I think. I wonder, if that, I wonder if we could just take a shortcut and just say, I wonder if that is the E. We just subtract the one from the other. Maybe that is the answer already, E. Which is the same as HF. I don't know. And then if we subtract this from whatever the work function of that metal is, which is where it's 4.4, then the rest is going to be what type of energy? Kinetic energy. I presume that's how we do that question. Okay. And then another metal has a threshold frequency of 7.5. Will the same photon be able to eject electrons from the surface of the metal? So it's very similar. Do you see it's similar to this problem we've just done? So we work out the work function of the next metal, and we see whether the photon that's provided has enough energy to exceed that work function. So I give this question a go, and that's it. Um, Okay, before you leave, remember for homework you've been doing those questions, those worksheet pages. I cannot ask you to this period, if you haven't done it, make sure you've finished. I want to sign all pages. So if you've done four, you're good to go. If not, do four pages so that you are good to go. For homework, you can complete this question. Or if you've done four pages, you know which ones I mean, the ones which just had the answers that you had. The same questions you've already done. Momentum, projectile motion, electrostatics. We have worksheet pages. I just want to sign four when you leave and then carry on with this question.